Welcome to The Rich Report, a podcast with news and information on the world of big data. Today, my guest is from a company called Foundation DB, and we have one of the co-founders of the company, David Rosenthal. David, welcome to the show today. Oh, thank you very much. Glad to be here. Well, well David, I'm curious, you know, how, how did this get started? You know, as a co-founder, there must be a good story here. Oh, well, <laughs> yeah, four years ago, a little more than four years ago, we started uh, Foundation DB when... We were actually looking into sort of various NoSQL databases and realized that we thought there was a big sort of gap in the offerings in the market that nobody was really trying to build a NoSQL style database that had some of the true, you know, transactional and ACID guarantees that have been around in the relational database world for, you know, a few decades. So uh, we got really, really interested in that project, obviously interested enough to go start a company. Well, great. Well, why don't we do this? Let's go. Uh, let's do your slides, and then we'll have a, a Q and A at the end. Sound good? Yeah, sounds great. So, yeah, jumping into it, I, you know, I want to talk to to you guys about NoSQL and ACID, and um, there are words that most people don't don't really associate together. ACID, of course, being sort of the transactional guarantees from relational databases, um, and NoSQL being this new generation of you know non-ACID. A distributed system. So, what what does it even mean to have a uh, you know NoSQL system that is ACID? So, so we'll get into that and in, in why I think it's it's a really important part of where NoSQL is going. So, going sort of the next slide to really understand uh, to get some context for this, I think you need to understand the the motivation of NoSQL. And I think the motivation was really around just making it easy to build and deploy applications, uh, making it you know easy to scale and operate these systems by having a distributed design, uh, making them automatically provide, you know, things like data replication and fault tolerance. And also, if you go look at the motivation right there in the name, NoSQL, obviously there was some, you know, clamoring for different data models other than just sort of this very static relational data model. Um, You know, the price issue is there as well, of course, but... um, to me, the big sort of thing that NoSQL misses in terms of making it easy to build and deploy applications is, is ACID transactions. And let me, let me sort of tell you why. And so coming to the next slide here, the case for ACID and NoSQL. So the first thing is bugs don't appear under concurrency. This is, this is the case for ACID. ACID um, means isolation. And it means that when you have an ACID database, whether it's a relational or a NoSQL database, it allows you, the developer or the application designer, to reason locally about your code rather than globally. And this is really important to be able to sort of build systems that can be reasoned about and that you know are correct. Um, For example, if every transaction in your system maintains an invariant, then you know that if you have ACID, that even if there's multiple clients running any combination of those transactions, that that invariant gets maintained. So really, ACID can isolate the impact of each client and make it much, much easier to design systems that work under concurrency. Going to the next point here, the other thing is that isolation means strong abstractions. And I have a super simple example here um, in code, something where you can store information about a user and uh, you can associate a name with a social security number. And we also want to write two functions, one that, one that gets the name from a social and one that gets the social from a name. And to store those two mappings of data, we actually have to store two pieces of data down within whatever database we're working on. But whatever we're doing, we'd really like an invariant, which is that if you take a name and then you get that social and then get the name back from the social that you got, that it's that same, that, that same name. And in this simple example, um, without ACID, if you store those multiple pieces of data in two different places, then it's very hard to synchronize their updates. And it means that when there's concurrent people trying to actually access this database, um, that invariant fails. But ACID guarantees means that that invariant is true. So th- the ability to create and reason about an invariant like that is, is really, really important. And sort of 
coming to the next slide here, the general point here is that abstractions that are built on a scalable, fault-tolerant, you know, foundation inherit those properties and are easy to build, and I'll talk about that in a second. But one of the most exciting things, I think, about what ACID does for you when you apply it to NoSQL, coming to the next slide, is that it allows you to remove or decouple the data model from the actual sort of storage substrate or database. So a NoSQL database with true ACID transactions can actually provide sort of this idea of polyglot persistence of, of many data models and APIs. So, you know, key value, graph, column-oriented document, you know, we go into all these different data models that you see in the NoSQL space. And traditionally, you have to actually have a different whole database system to support a different data model. Um, and there's some databases out there in the market that support maybe a couple of data models on top of one engine. But when you have true ACID transactions and the ability to um, create these abstractions and these indexes and all of the other things that you need to build these richer data structures, you can actually you know, pull the data structures out of the database itself and have a single engine that, um, that can power them all. So it's a, it's a really important point of not just sort of acid for acid's sake and you know, transactions for transactions sake, but what you can build with transactions. So I think there's a lot of huge advantages uh, to, to acid and NoSQL and combining them. So I think it only sort of naturally begs the question here on the next slide, which is, you know, why is there no acid NoSQL system? And to understand this, we have to jump here to, I think, the historical perspective. And, in 2008, when FoundationDB was getting started, uh, NoSQL didn't really exist. And uh, I have a Google, Google Trends graph here that sort of shows the CAP theorem in NoSQL, and we were really sort of pre that time. So jumping to the next slide, databases in 2008, uh, were, these solutions were just emerging. Um, and NoSQL was coming to the market, we have to remember, to replace sharding and caching solutions that were in place to try to achieve these larger scales. And the important thing to understand here is that those sharding and caching solutions that had been built uh, sort of ad hoc by various companies had already thrown out consistency. Uh, sharding throws out global asset transactions. Caching throws out synchronization of your memcached cluster with your database. So, NoSQL was coming in to try to replace a system that already had thrown out ACID. And that's important to understand. That's why I think it wasn't a requirement of these initial NoSQL systems. Moving to the next slide, the CAP theorem was another thing that was sort of looming large in people's minds back in this day. And uh, Eric Brewer, who was sort of the, the brain behind the CAP theorem, was saying things like, you know, CAP, it means consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. And you have to pick two out of, the, two out of three. And coming to the next slide, other people like uh, the CTO of Amazon.com were saying things like data inconsistency in large-scale distributed systems has to be tolerated. Um, and he was saying that it, you have to tolerate this both for performance reasons and to be able to handle faults. And so... With, with, you know, with theorems and CTOs, you know, all sort of saying we have to throw this out, um, it's sort of inevitable that it was thrown out. And coming to the next slide, to me, the key misunderstanding back in 2008 of the CAP theorem was, and I've pulled sort of a, quote, a representative quote that I just found on the web, people saying stuff like this. The availability property, that's the A in the CAP theorem, means that the system is online and that the client of the system can expect to receive a response. Well, it's absolutely true that the word availability, um, you know, sort of means in our common usage that the system's up, right? But it turns out that availability in this um, CAP theorem is a little bit different, so we'll talk about that. Coming to the next slide, the, the conclusion that you have to come to from hearing what people were saying about the CAP theorem in 2008 was that if you want to scale, of course, you're going to need a distributed design, and that if you're distributed, you're always going to have some machines that are failing, so you're going to need a high availability. 
And if you need high availability, you're going to have to sacrifice the C in the CAP theorem, which is consistency. And so, you know, so we got to do that, right? Um, and the answer is no. You know, almost all of these statements don't really make sense when you drill in and think about them a little bit more closely. But coming to the next slide, I've highlighted here what I think is the biggest misconception, was that availability in the CAP theorem sense does not mean high availability of the database as a whole. And this is a really important uh, distinction. Availability in the CAP theorem sense is this notion of perfect availability which means not just that the system is up, but that every node in the system, whether or not it's connected to or can communicate with any other node in the system, is still available for both reads and for writes. And so, I mean, to me, it's sort of intuitively obvious that if one piece of a system gets disconnected and can't communicate with another one, then of course it's gonna be impossible for those two pieces to agree. And I think that's really what the CAP theorem is saying. If the system gets split in two, that's the partition, you have to choose either for those two pieces to um, you know, stop working or to stay in sync. But the key insight is that you don't actually have to have both pieces stop working. You can have the smaller piece stop working and keep the bigger piece working and available. And that's exactly what Foundation DB does. And it's exactly what other uh, distributed transactional databases like Google Spanner do to maintain high availability even with a partition. So in interesting topic, but uh, I wanted to fast forward to how our thinking about CAP has evolved. So on the next slide, I have some of uh, what people are saying now. So Eric Brewer, you know, in 2013 is saying, you know, here's why two out of three, this notion of picking two out of the three of, is misleading, and that CAP really only prohibits this thing of perfect availability, which is, you know, maybe not as important a property to the system. On the next slide, I have Werner Vogels, not saying that we have to give it up altogether, but he's now saying that achieving strict consistency can come at a cost in update or read latency and may result in lower throughput. And so he's saying there's a cost in latency and throughput, which he's basically saying transactions are slow. And I'll get to this later in, in the talk, but this is a sort of, this is a legitimate concern that transactions make a NoSQL database slow, but you'll see that it's not necessarily the case. On the next slide is sort of my favorite quote about our modern understanding of the CAP theorem and of transactions and the importance of them. And this is, what, this is from the Google Spanner paper. So this is Google's second generation in-house NoSQL product called Spanner. And Google says that we think that it's better to have application programmers deal with whatever performance problems there are due to overuse of transactions rather than always coding around the lack of transactions. And it's that coding around the lack of transactions that's so difficult and time consuming um, and there's a bunch of other great quotes in the Google Spanner paper about how hard it is to build a reliable system um, that you can sort of reason about and provide these, you know, strong abstractions in without having any transactions. So with this sort of understanding of how the CAP theorem has evolved and that, you know, maybe it doesn't mean that you can't build a distributed transactional database. Maybe, maybe it only means that, you know, there's some trade-offs to be made in terms of performance or whatever. I sort of want to take you to the next slide and talk to you about how I think you can combine ACID and NoSQL. So jumping right here to the next slide, the ACID NoSQL plan. Um, here's what I think we want to shoot to do with our modern understanding of the CAP theorem. We want to maintain the scalability and fault tolerance that we're in the first generation NoSQL databases. And we want to sort of leverage our modern 2013 understanding of the CAP theorem and deliver a CP system that is one that's consistent under a partition um, that has true global ACID transactions. So to explain this just a little bit further, in the CAP theorem, you have to say when, you, when the partition happens, do you choose C or A? And um, any transactional database um, have to choose C, but just choosing C doesn't mean that you actually have transactions. It means that you have consistency, which 
is some guarantees about if somebody does a write and then somebody does a read, you know, you're guaranteed to see the results of that write. But there's a bunch of other properties that you need in a true ACID transactional system, including, you know, one of the most key ones, transactional isolation, that, um, that require C, but that C isn't sufficient. So we want to build a CP system that goes that extra step to not just consistency, but to actually having true global ACID transactions. And to do this, when we do this, we're going to enable these abstractions and enable the ability to build many data models. And we want to somehow, somehow do this all while delivering high performance on each sort of node and not, you know, slowing the system down to a halt. Because if we have to pay a factor of 10 or a factor of 100 um, to build a, an ACID NoSQL system, that's not very interesting, right? Or there's a limited set of applications for that. So jumping to the next slide is um, there's a lot of different ways to build the sort of decomposition approach I want to talk about. There's a lot of different ways to build a distributed transactional system. But uh, at FoundationDB, we've took an approach which is, um, which is much less common uh, than some of the other ones. And what we've done is we've taken the traditional processing pipeline of a ACID database, like you'd see this in a Berkeley DB or an Oracle or a MySQL, and we've thought about decomposing the problem into the individual stages and working on each of those stages separately. So going to the next slide here, the stages of processing a transaction are basically, you know, the first stage is we want to accept all the client transactions, right? So all of these transactions that have multiple reads and writes in them and they need to be done atomically and together and all this, they all need to come into some part of the system. And they can't quite go directly to where the data is stored because they need to run through some sort of transaction processing uh, framework first. So the first stage is just accepting the client transactions. Uh, the second sort of key, key stage is applying concurrency control. And this, what this really means is enforcing the transactional guarantees, enforcing transaction isolation, um, enforcing you know, atomicity, all of that. The third stage is um, all about the D in ACID. And this is writing to transaction logs. So in FoundationDB, we want to make sure, and in any ACID you know, database, you need to make sure that when a client commits a transaction or does a write to the system, that you can actually guarantee that that data is flushed to disk and completely you know, persistent before you return success. And so that third stage, writing the transaction logs, which you know, exists in a traditional database, also exists in FoundationDB. Uh, the fourth stage is updating the persistent data representation. And you can see, see in this little diagram here, these little boxes, that the fourth stage has the most boxes. <laughs> and, um, the fourth stage in FoundationDB is really sort of the equivalent of a traditional NoSQL database. It's just a distributed data store that's using, you know, traditional data structures like, like B-trees to, and, you know, solid state disks and, you know, sort of all of the sort of modern techniques to just store data in a, you know, replicated, partitioned way so that as you add machines, you know, you get more capacity, you get more performance and all of that. And... The real challenge of what we've done at FoundationDB is we've taken each of these stages and we've figured out how to make each stage both scalable and how to make each stage fault tolerant. And those are really, really tough problems because normally when you're running this little processing stage in a traditional database, um, if the system fails, like if you turn the power off, all of those stages just fail together. So it's a lot easier to reason about than if each individual stage could potentially fail and come back online, you know, and maybe get partitioned away and then come back online. So a tremendous amount of engineering work has gone into sort of making the correctness and fault tolerance of this architecture work. But the upside um, is performance. Uh, by being able to address each of the separate processing stages um, individually, we're able to optimize each of them individually and achieve really good performance. So let's move to the next slide and sort of see what the surprise is. Uh, and, and this was a surprise, a surprise to us, and it's a surprise to a lot of people that look at what we're doing at FoundationDB. When you add ACID 
um, processing onto the front of our NoSQL, our basic NoSQL engine, it turns out that enforcing transactions and enforcing ACID is actually only about 10% of the total CPU work of the system in just sort of general resources, and that the actual distributed storage in updating that persistent representation actually represents about 90% of the work. So this is a really interesting finding. Remember, Werner Vogels was saying, you know, we could achieve consistency, but it's going to come at this performance cost. Well, it sort of, to me, begs the question, what's the cost? And at FoundationDB, we're in a, sort of a unique position to answer it because of the way that we've designed the system. We can truly isolate the transaction part from the NoSQL part and tell you that it's only about a 10% performance penalty to achieve transactions. Now, it makes the system a lot harder to build, <laughs> but it's actually not that much slower. And that's really exciting, because I think if we had to give up a factor of 10 to get all these benefits of transactions, it would be like, well, you know, maybe on a case-by-case -case basis, that would be interesting. Um, you know, maybe some places the benefits outweigh the cost. But if it's just a 10% cost, I think it's a, it's, it's a slam dunk. It's, it's a property that you absolutely want in your system and that really helps you build a solid system for not much of a cost. So going to the next slide, you know, here's what we're doing at FoundationDB. I've sort of talked around it a few times. But FoundationDB is database software that, you know, you can download uh, free from our website and actually even use free uh, for free in small production clusters. It sort of brings together a few key properties. It's scalable, fault tolerant, just like a traditional NoSQL database. But it has this really special property that it's transactional. And um, its native API is an ordered key value store. But again, because it has transactions, we can build other abstractions on top of those keys and values, and we call those layers. So we're building layers at FoundationDB, and so are some of our customers in the community. But just to give you a, a taste of what kinds of things you can build on top of a transactional key value API, we've built a graph database that implements the Blueprints graph standard. We've built and are rolling out in the coming months a SQL database, a SQL layer that stores all of its state inside that transactional key value store, but provides a ANSI SQL compatible uh, front end. We've built a document database um, that's analogous to um, what you'd see with something like MongoDB that can store sort of hierarchies of data and have basic indexing properties. And we've also built a system for storing uh, event data, uh, which is a very common use case for NoSQL systems. So by having transactions, we're actually able to deliver layers that let you run multiple data models on top of one storage substrate. And I, I think that's the really sort of the really exciting thing about where ACID and NoSQL, this combination, can take us. So sort of coming to the, coming to the last slide here, I think the, the vision for where NoSQL needs to go is that the next generation of NoSQL needs to maintain you know, what's been good about the last generation, high performance, scalability, and fault tolerance. But we really need to add ACID transactions, and with that, add true data model flexibility. Thanks a lot. Well, thanks for that, Dave. You know, a question, when you look at what this enables, I wanted to ask you about this, the ability to support multiple data models. How is that beneficial for an organization? Does it, is it all about flexibility and business models, or what would you say? Yeah, so I talked to a lot of people about this, and um, it, it, it turns out that from what I see, the real pain in the NoSQL world is around the ops team and the operational side of things. And um, the way that I describe this, um, you know, not to pick on MongoDB, but just to use it as an example, is that a developer can download MongoDB from the website, um, read about the API, look at their great documentation that they have, and learn sort of 90% of what there is to know about MongoDB's API in like weekend. Um, the challenging part is that if that developer now wants to bring MongoDB into the organization, um, somebody in the ops team needs to go learn about MongoDB. And it is very difficult for somebody in the ops team to download, install, and learn 90% of what it takes 
to run MongoDB in a production environment in a weekend. That's a much longer learning process, and many fewer people you know, can quickly develop those skills. So one of the challenges with this idea that each NoSQL database has its own data model is that the developers within the organization start pulling in many products uh, to get access to these many data models. And I talk to people all the time that don't just have one NoSQL database, they have you know, five or six or seven. Um, and you know, one of their engineers just came to them talking about this cool new one that they saw, which is the eighth one. Um, at the back end of that, <laughs> they now have eight systems that they all need to run and stay up and scale each of them individually to sort of have their stack scale. And so a lot of the pain there, it, it, the benefits on the developer side in these data models, right? But the pain is on the ops side and all the different engines. And, and uh, great. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about resiliency because, you know, I come from uh, the HPC side of things, Dave, and, we're, uh, you know, th these are worlds where there might be hundreds of thousands of cores or even, as they talk about exascale, uh, 10 to the 18th flops that uh, they might have... Um, a billion threads running around in such a system and and this is a case where as you said everything something's failing at some point in time always right and and you have to build a system that um, can keep functioning and per perform service levels uh, in that state and uh, uh, is this something you're seeing as is um, more and more of a requirement as people scale to the cloud I mean, yeah, it, it it absolutely is. I mean, I think if you go look at look at NoSQL systems in actual deployment today, uh, I don't think that you'll see people running. You know, t I mean, tens of thousands of cores would be, I think, highly unusual. Um, so, you know, I don't think you know most people are dealing with that problem where you know something's failing every second or something's failing every minute. You know, they might be more like something's failing every day or something's failing every hour, but um, you absolutely need to make sure that if something's failing every day or every hour, that you have, you know, failover times that are either, you know, very short um, or, you know, completely invisible. And that's one of the challenges that I think everybody building a system in this space is facing, you know, making it so that the system can, you know, shift data around transparently in the background without, you know, the client or the user noticing that in the foreground. Um, I'll just sort of speak to one of the specific challenges that, you know, we see in these distributed systems is that as soon as you distribute data everywhere, um, there's sort of inevitably a latency associated with getting it, right? It's going to take, it's going to take a millisecond or whatever to just to jump to a new computer um, and, you know, talk to, talk to RAM or talk to an SSD. And at the same time that you have this sort of latency, which, you know, a millisecond or let's say a moderate latency, um, you also have the desire to be able to do millions or tens of millions of operations per second. And there's some, you know, relatively simple queuing theory around, you know, Little's Law, you do a little bit of division, and you realize that to achieve that throughput with that latency, there's going to need to be a tremendous number of things in flight in the system at once. So, a distributed system like FoundationDB might have as many as tens of thousands of, of requests actually in flight at once. And building a system that knows how to deal with all of those in-flight things requires a whole different set of tools and techniques. And I think that's one of the um, really interesting parts about, about engineering these big distributed databases um, is, is dealing with all of the things that are in flight. Right, right. Well, great. Well, so, Dave, kind of a wrap-up question here. How easy is it to kick the tires uh, on the Foundation DB and, and see if it's if it's got the the right stuff for me? Well, well, uh, the, probably the easiest thing to do, especially if somebody's on EC2, or you're on EC2, is that we have a cloud formation template uh, for a Foundation DB cluster, which means that you can uh, just go to our website. You know, no sign up required, and uh, just find our cloud formation template and, you know, literally pick, pick an availability region for, for Amazon and, you know, pick how big you want that cluster to be and it'll fire up a fault tolerant distributed transactional FoundationDB cluster that you can be, you know, talking to in a couple of minutes. Um, 
At the other end of the scale, if you just want to try out the API, um, we have installers for local machines, for local development on a single machine, for you know Windows, Mac, and, and Linux, and uh, those are you know really quick to set up. Uh, again, just a couple of minutes, so very easy to get started, and and like I said, free free to get started with, and even free to use um, in production use wow. uh, for clusters smaller than six machines. Sure, sure. Well, this has been terrific. Well, Dave, I want to um, thank you once again for coming on the show today. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me. Great to be here, and uh, keep in touch. All right, will do. Okay, folks, that's it for the Rich Report. Stay tuned for more news and information on the world of big data. 